Good afternoon and welcome to you all. Welcome to the Faculty of Science and Technology public lecture series where we continue to ask questions, find answers and solutions as we unearth information and learn a lot more about what's happening in our environment, in our laboratories, in our spaces all across Jamaica, especially here from the UWI Mona campus. Today we delve into some dirty waters. It's in fact dirty water, dead fish and distressed communities. I think we know enough about that if we've been following the newspapers and the articles. But the question is, how, how much do we know? And we want to take us through a series of experts who have been working with fisheries, with water quality, and persons who are in the field of the environment, as well as in the field where they are being impacted by the environment. We have five very interesting speakers today, and we'll introduce you to them as we go through. But I'd like to welcome Ms. Anjanette Murray, Mr. Richard Nelson, Dr. Teresa Rodriguez Ferguson, sorry, Rodriguez Moody, Mr. Marlon Green, and Mr. Dr. Andre Coy. I will do an introduction for each of them as they come on to make their presentations, but I just wanted to welcome them and thank them for making themselves available for what we think is an important discussion. Each of them will bring a different dimension, a different thought as to how we do what we do. At the end, we really want to end up what can we do? What have we done? And what do we do next? Because the problem has been here for a while. The fish kills, dirty water is not a today problem. It's been here for a while. And it's important that we take a moment and look at what we have, what we know, and how we can take this information forward. So welcome, and I look forward to a wonderful set of discussions. Our first presenter is going to be Ms. Anjanette Murray. And Anjanette is at the National Fisheries Authority She's the current statistician data manager and has responsibility for statistics and information about fisheries and aquaculture. So no doubt she will be able to tell us a bit about the fish, the dead fish, and what we need to know, especially as it relates to fisheries conservation and fisheries management. Her area is protection of fisheries water through sustainable management. And she has the elevation to do so, having co-authored a number of scientific research publications um, about management of key fisheries, conch and lobster, etc. So we look forward to her 18 years of experience coming out in 10 minutes. Anjanette, what have you got to tell us? Thank you so much, Professor Weber. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to the Faculty of Science and Technology for inviting us to be a part of this public lecture series. I would just want to take it from the view to share with you uh, just a little bit about what the NFA is doing. So permit me to go ahead and share my presentation and then we can get right into it. Uh, let me go ahead. Please confirm that you are. Yes, you're good to go. Yeah, okay, great. All right, so um, we are looking at the protection of our fisheries water through sustainable management. And I'm going to just give us an overview of what the strategic framework what, what we are about, our vision, our mission, our core values at fisheries, just some sector overview and highlights of some achievements um, and who we are, and just to summarize in the end. So the National Fisheries Authority, new kid on the block, if you will, freshly established in 2018, and we took effect, um, became operational in 2020. So, and this was given rise from the Fisheries Act of 2018, Section 5.1. Our roots have been embedded deeply in the dedicated staff, members of fisheries, the then Fisheries Division, which was established in 1949, and we were a part of the government division. So we have been building from then um, the entire sector and managing. Now we're in a transitionary phase, and that uh, we're transitioning to a statutory body, which allows the NSA um, the, the ability to regulate our fisheries and agriculture sectors more independently. And this is within a a strengthening a uh, structure of a strengthened legislative framework, and this is enabled by impact. This we didn't have much of in the initial phases under the fisheries division because what you find was that the same fisheries officers are the ones who are in data collections, the persons who are analyzing, persons who are enforcing. So we were very much involved in everything. But now, under the new creature, as it were, we have more strength in legislative framework, and so our mandate and our responsibility. Um, it's, it's pretty much continuous, but we're responsible for the whole management and development of the fisheries and agriculture. So our role then, um, our responsibility, we ensure that there is conservation for the fisheries. 
we collect, we compile, we analyze data, we monitor, we control, we enforce um, any activities as it relates to fisheries and aquaculture. We are also chiefly responsible for granting licenses, authorization, permits, and any allocation of fishing rights, quotas, for all of the persons who have any intent to fish in our waters. For the vision, our vision, the NFA is a model of excellence. It's in capturing fisheries and aquaculture management. And our mission is to facilitate whatever sustainable development um, of our fishery sectors, including agriculture. And it is going to be achieved through effective and efficient management, regulation, administration, and participatory governance for all. And you can find at the core of us where integrity is there, accountability, fairness, respect, this transparency, uh, goals oriented, and there's professionalism, and there's, of course, the big teamwork. And just overview of where we are now, we have capture and our fishing industry capture and culture fish. So from the very beginning of time when we were registering fishers, we have one register, we have accounted for over 32,000 fishers in total. Same for the vessels, we have 90, over 9,000 vessels, um, and most of which were artisanal and non decked canoes. We knew that in the 70s, there was a commercial agriculture being established, um, semi-intensive earthen ponds that continues along throughout the St. Catherine and the Clarendon area. And of course, primary species is for food, is tilapia that has been cultured and continues to be the primary one now. Um, we have over 150 fish farmers and 140 ornament fishers. And of course, we contribute 0.54% to the overall gross domestic product, talking about to the tune of 94 million US dollars annually, looking at over 40,000 40, individuals, you know, that we employ directly, supporting over 200,000 Jamaicans. Now, what we're showing here, what I'm showing you here is the, um, just a general schematic or the map of where our grounds are. And this is what we have jurisdiction for. All the South Shelf, the, the, you know, we can see the fishing grounds here in the north from figure one. Um, we're talking about Peter Banks and other associated banks. Um, the figure two shows you where we position within the joint regime, er, I mean, within the Caribbean era. And you can see the joint regime that we have with the Colombian water. So all of this water, that's ours. We manage. Internally, talking about inland rivers, this is just a map just pinpointing where the rivers are um, across the island um, for mainland Jamaica. This is where we have jurisdiction over. And just to go in, uh, we have here the structure, the null structure of NFA. And you can see that it's, it's really now huge. It's, it, it comprises of a, a variety of divisions um, being assigned different functions and rules, and I'll just get into it a little. We have the executive direction and management. And so this consists this pretty much of our CEO, uh, the corporate services has the legal arm, the legal services and the accounts. And in this di division here, it's really dealing with the full transition of the authority to become that effective um, governing body of this fisheries water that we're talking about. Our capture fisheries development section focuses on their task with the mandate to deal with the management of all the captured fisheries in Jamaica. And this is achieved pretty much primarily through research, development, um, and development of implementing sound management practices. So that's how they have at the core their responsibility there. For the agriculture section now, we're talking about being responsible for food security. So we address issues where there's lack in fish supplies and so on um, as an alternative source of a protein. Um, and they regulate and overseeing agriculture farms in Jamaica. And we achieve this through the fry production branch. Um, the branch members have also assist those fishers with roots, seed stocks, and so on it, to help out with their production. Um, we have the extension unit. Um, they also provide expert advice um, to persons who are in the industry, who want to come into the industry. Um, yeah, so that's the agriculture component. I want to point out now for addressing some matters that have been on the table now is the fisheries compliance and statistics. It's a pull together of other areas that were sort of like independent under the old um, model. But in this new model, we have this is a newly established sub program or division um, for, 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 for fisheries. And here we improve the whole licensing and registration regime for stakeholders 
um, there is the strengthening and the enforcement arm. So this component actually came out, and I'll speak a little bit more into that, um, the strengthening of the enforcement arm, the energy. And we continue to do data collection to make sure that there's informed management decisions. So um, as relates to the compliance unit now that falls under this division, we have now unstaffed 43 members. And this represents 50%. The They're able to move around the entire island of Jamaica and covering rivers, covering, um, we're talking about, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, we, we, we work with, we do joint activities with persons such as the Jamaica Constabulary Force, with the Jamaica Defense Coast Guard, we do offshore patrols. Um, and we also do land inspections, and this is done weekend. The land inspections, we're talking about the rivers, we're talking about the beaches, um, we're talking establishments, food establishments, wherever they are. Our enforcement or compliance officers have that now under their belt, and so we can now focus in on that. In terms of our sensitization, uh, we not only do we just go out and enforce and enforce, there is a sensitization program, there's an educational component that not only the compliance officers are involved in, there are the extension workers who will, on the capture fisheries, on the aquaculture, who will go out and also provide knowledge. Um, knowledge, primarily, I think, of the Fishing Act is also a very important thing because since we're recently established, persons do not know what we are now about. As it relates specifically to the topic, we talk about fish, and we can probably get down into that later on in the discussion, but um, in response to certain things, we now have the tool to implement orders, fish habitat protection orders, that um, in response to when we hear that there's some destruction, um, and this, again, um, is a, a, something that has been given to us a privilege through the act. We are now able to charge persons <laughs> uh, who have been in breach and that kind of thing to make them, but, but then, you know, make them aware is one key thing. So we actually educate persons that we can't do this on our own, which leads me to my next slide. How is it that we are able to fulfill? And I just want to wrap, it, wrap up with this. How do we fulfill our mandate? Um, we can't do this alone. We know all the responsibilities that you we have we spoke about and you saw the jurisdiction that we could have had. Um, we're moving from about a hundred and a little over hundred members of staff to what is close to four hundred, but to man an entire public an era, a space like that will require not just ourselves, but we have to part. So partnership is definitely a must. And so partnership with ministries, departments, agencies such as NEPA, as you'll hear from my colleague later on, um, there's a Coast Guard, police. And we partner with entities like yourself, the universities, and so on. We also do community involvement. I mentioned that there's an example. No, we are working with schools for the poor. We are equipping our officials and our, our persons who are part of the industry, community members, about safe handling and so on. NGO, sanctuaries, and internationally, we have our international obligations. So it's wide and on compact. Can't do this on our own. We have to partner. And so with this, I hope this gives you a Good enough to start our conversation with, from the National Fisheries Authority. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Murray. Good information, and I think it, it helps us set the tone. I noticed that you are talking about partnerships with the ministry, with community, and that's important because remember, we are talking about dirty water, dead fish, and distressed communities. So yes. it's important that we capture that aspect, and we're going to hear from various components. So you partner with the ministry, with the community. NGO and internationally. And we have a little bit of all of that coming out in our discussions. I'm gonna invite people to start putting their questions together, thoughts as to what are we gonna do? Because remember, at the end of this, we want not prescription, suggestions, ways that can allow us to better manage what is clearly a situation impacting many. Well, if the Fisheries Act has teeth and can bite, the NRC Act has even more and should be biting even more. I'm therefore in a position to invite Mr. Richard Nelson to be our next presenter. And Richard comes to us with a wealth of experience. I know Richard has been in the NEPA for almost 30 years, and I know he started as a wildlife biologist, but he's moved through enforcement and compliance. And since 2017, he's been promoted to Senior Manager for Environmental Management, where he has direct responsibility for executing programs managing national pollution prevention, monitoring, and assessment to facilitate sustainable national development, which means dirty water, dead fish, 
and distressed communities fall all within its ambit. Richard, I invite you to speak. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And I'm confirming that you're seeing the slide. We hope to see them in a few moments. We hope to. I don't know why. Uh, it was working perfectly well before. I'm not sure what is happening here. Nothing? Any change? Any change? Not from where I am. Not from where you are, let me. Our technical team. Let me go back. Oops. Let me share. Okay, I, I think I see what the problem is. Um, we are seeing your screen now. We're seeing. Okay, that's better. You may be one or two slides in, though, but yeah. I don't know if you are clicking. All right. All right. Thank you very much um, for that introduction and um, very interesting presentation preceding this one. And uh, I think I will try and continue along the same vein. Um, so NEPO's role in protecting our water resources, uh, of course, dirty water, dead fishes, and distressed communities. What do we do? And the timing could not be better. So uh, who's NEPO? Basically, NEPO is responsible for the conservation, protection, and wise use of Jamaica's natural resources, along with the orderly development of the built environment. So really, we're, we're supposed to be the premier environmental agency that has some really heavy duty responsibilities across the country. Uh, we operate under several pieces of environmental and planning laws mainly the Natural Resources Conservation Act 1991, the Beach Control Act 1951, the Wildlife Protection Act 1945, the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, I put this diagram here just to give you a quick synopsis of the organization structure of NEPO. And more in particular for this presentation, I want to highlight a couple of areas in NEPO that are key to, to this to the protection of our water resources. So we have the Environmental Management and Conservation Division, within which we have the Environmental Management Subdivision, of which I am the head. And in that subdivision, you have the Pollution Monitoring and Assessment Branch and the Pollution Prevention Branch. And of course, within the Pollution Prevention Monitoring and Assessment Branch, we have the Wastewater and Sludge Regulations Unit. Uh, you will hear a little bit more about these as we move along. Coupled with that, we work very closely with the Legal and Enforcement Division, which comprises of the Legal Services Branch and the Enforcement Branches. So when it comes to protecting our water, um, these are the key uh, areas, for departments in the agency that uh, the agency rely heavily on. So how does NEPA play a role? NEPA is really a regulatory agency, and by way of the legislation it administers, more specifically, the NRC Act and the Wildlife Protection Act, um, it does play a role in protecting our, our water resources. Now, I heard Prof earlier said never, you know, have some big teeth. Now, what is in front of you does, definitely doesn't reflect big teeth because the fine, the maximum fine under the NRC Act currently is a, um, a, is a maximum of $50,000, and that's Jamaican dollars or prison sentence of up to 12 months. And under the Wildlife Protection Act, the, it, the fines can be as much as 100,000 or a prison sentence of up to 12 months. Um, of course, these are grossly you know, outdated and currently the agency is in the process of having the, the, these, these two pieces of legislation updated so that the fines can be um, increased. Now, how does the NRC Act guide NEPA in protecting the resources? Section 9 of the Act requires that um, certain developments must get an environmental permit. And of course, there's a regulation, the Permit and License Regulation 1996, last amended in 2015. It lists a number of developments that must get an environmental permit. And these permits will stipulate conditions that guide the operations of these developments. In, in order to mitigate or minimize the environmental uh, negative impacts. Section 10 of the NRC Act also speaks to the need for an environmental impact assessment, which guides the permitting process. 
Section 12, it speaks to the requirement for environmental license. And this, this sets standards um, for the discharges to the environment. Then where there is failure to acquire either a permit or a license, the agency can take enforcement action in, in the form of a cessation order under Section 13. Uh, Section 17 of the Act, um, the agency can request information on pollution from various facilities. Uh, Section 18, an enforcement notice, if the agency is of the view that the activity of an individual or a facility is very detrimental to environmental, um, the environment or public health, an enforcement notice can be served to have it stop and also to remediate and return the area to what it was before. Now, Section 38 gives the minister the power to make regulations, and there are several regulations that speak, that speak to, to protect the resources. Uh, we have standard and code practices with respect to the protection and rehabilitation of the environment and conservation of natural resources, uh, with description of categories, and cons um, enterprise and construction that requires an, e an EIA, and an environmental permit, speaks a concentration of substances that may be released in the environment, so we'll set limits. It speaks to the importation of collection, recycling, recovery, or disposal of substances which may be hazardous to the environment. Um, design, construction, operation, maintenance, and monitoring of facilities for the control of pollution and the disposal of waste. So all of these are various pieces of um, regulations that are in place. Now, one of the key pieces of regulation that is, that is in place that protect our water is the wastewater and sludge regulations of 2030. And basically, it speaks to the need for a license to construct and operate wastewater treatment plants, as well as discharge treated effluent. Now, when we say wastewater treatment plants, there are two types of wastewater. We have the domestic wastewater, which is sewage, and we have uh, trade effluent, which basically is the waste generated, wastewater generated from industries uh, and, and such facilities alike. And it requires that you obtain a license for the construction of the plant, a license for the operation, and of course, a license to discharge. Now, the regulation also sets some standards that must be met. And this is just an example because there is kind of a difference, slight difference between that of trade effluent and that of sewage effluent. But pretty much some of the, the, um, the parameters are very um, common between both. And we have them there. And of course, they, they, these regulations are available on the agency's website. And for, for your reading pleasure, I mean, you can always visit and, and, and read at your leisure. Under the wastewater and sludge um, 2013 regulation, we also apply the polluter pay principle. And basically, um, it's, a, it's a principle where in which the polluter is expected. If the polluter pollutes the environment, um, a, a charge is applied. And for a wastewater and sludge regulation, this charge is called a discharge fee. And regula regulation 44 one states that the license fee shall pay the prescribed annual effluent discharge fee based on the loading of the effluent discharge. This might sound a little complicated, so let me break it down a bit to explain to you what this means. The discharge fee has two components to it. It has a monitoring and inspection fee, and it also has uh, a loading fee. In the equation, if you can see it clearly, the loading fee is the B open bracket one plus a factor minus U, where U is represent discount for beneficial use. And of course, the, the weighting factor is, is for the receptor. The, the regulation allows for discharges to groundwater, to surface water, including dry gullies, streams, rivers, wetlands, etc., and to the marine environment, coastal areas, and also to enclose and semi-enclose water bodies, such as arbors and ponds and of course, open sea. Now the weighting factor varies based on the sensitivity of the receptor and that is used in the calculation. So pretty much what this is saying, if, if it is that the facilities or the polluters meet the standards of the wastewater regulations, then there's very little to nothing that they will pay 
for for um, the, the discharge fee. However, if they are not meeting the standards and there are there's very large volumes, then the discharge fees can be very very. But the idea is is to try and you know encourage persons that business these days they prefer to save money, right? And so the least they pollute, the better it is for them. Um, the Wildlife Protection Act also plays a role, and there are two sections, uh, 10 and 11, placing noxious material in a body of water or speaks to the protection of water containing fish. And in recent times, we have had very good reason to use that section of the Act to take certain facilities support. Um, so NEPA does not only apply to the legislation, we also undertake monitoring. Um, there, so within the division that I lead, there is the Pollution Monitoring and Assessment Branch that goes out and do routine monitoring right across the island, both in the marine space and, and in the freshwater areas. Um, we also do compliance monitoring for facilities that have permits and license, and we'll collect samples and develop a profile, not just for the companies, but also for the water bodies that we monitor. And there is also what we call routine and verification monitoring, where though the licensees are required by law to submit water quality reports, we will also do some verification monitoring to, to cross it against what they are submitting uh, on a quarterly basis. Importantly, to whenever there are pollution incidents, the agency will also go out and collect uh, water quality, which will form a part of the file in in our in, in a case should we should we move with prosecution and so forth. Um, just like the fisheries authority, we also work with our other stakeholders. And I've listed a couple here, but the, the list is not exhaustive. There are others, but um, from a regulator standpoint, for example, Ministry of Health and Wellness through the Environmental Health Unit, the Water Resources, we were close with National Fisheries. MGD, uh, Jamaica Bauxite Institute. And of course, we were closer with UWI because on many occasions, we have to send samples or have consultations with the UWI to assist in some of the cases and investigations that we undertake. But not only that, the agency also works with other partners. And so one, one such partner will be presenting very shortly, the Jamaica Environmental Trust. Um, they are very, they ensure that the agency is on its toes when it comes to the environmental management. Um, we work with communities, local communities, and so on. And um, if you look at images, the image to well, my right, on the right of the screen, this is a recent initiative under the Raya Cobra Early Warning System, where we have now gone in and put up uh, signs indicate providing contact numbers um, should there be poll pollution incidents. Um, the various agencies can be notified in a timely manner and it trigger a response process, which should minimize the potential impacts from such an incident. And if this is very successful, if this um, turns out to be successful, it may be implemented across other areas um, in the country. What are some of the future regulatory focus? Uh, one of the main things that we have seen is that our water bodies are impacted by polluting substances, mainly from discharges. Now, if we can minimize those discharges um, to our water bodies by using them in a different way, rather than just sending it out into rivers or bodies, um, it should minimize the impact. So for example, consideration is there for aquifer recharge. Of course, this would have still have to meet uh, the standards under the wastewater and sludge regulation but there will not be a direct um, threat to our surface water. Uh, the use for um, reuse of effluent for irrigation. There are standards in the wastewater and source regulation that speaks to irrigation. And there are a number of places in, in Jamaica where that is currently being undertaken. For example, on the North Coast, we have one particular um, facility that does collect wastewater from the hotel treated to irrigation standard, and is sent back to the hotels to, to irrigate their green spaces. Uh, one of the considerations, and we are working on the what is called a two plus project, uh, with the IDB, um, to see how we can implement the reuse of wastewater in household systems. Um, it's a long-term long goal, but at some point, 
we want to reach a point where even the householders, your gray water may be used for your gardening, for your, your lawn, while the black water is sent for proper treatment. So in summary, NEPA's role in protecting our water resources basically is guided by the legislation that it administers through our routine and compliance monitoring and research, and most importantly, collaboration with our stakeholders, not just the regulatory stakeholders, but also our community and the NGOs who play a very important role in assisting the agency to identify the threats that are there to our water balance. Bodies. And with that, I would like to say thank you for listening. And remember, if there's an incident in the recovery, you have the signs there, the numbers are there, and you can even scan me and it goes straight to our website and you fill in the information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Nelson, for an interesting presentation. And like Anjanette, you have told us about partnerships and about how you function. I like the fact that you've dealt with a lot of the dirty water when Anjanette has dealt with the fish, but we haven't yet gotten to the dead fish and the dirty water, and we'll put them together, which we know is part of our problems. Um, I see questions coming in, and we're going to hold them, but please keep sending them in. Um, there are questions about fines. There are questions about partnerships. So we will have a robust discussion in a few moments. So we look forward to that. Well, if you have never heard of Dr. Teresa Rodriguez Moody, it means you have lived under a rock for the last couple of years. She is an environmental scientist and is the CEO of JET. And JET has been at the forefront of almost every environmental advocacy discussion that has happened over the last couple of years. She works on projects that are geared towards protection of Jamaica's natural resources and public health. And as a graduate of our institution, I must say, the three speakers so far have all been graduates of our institution. So I'm, I'm going to assume that the, where they are now and how they reach back for those partnerships is an important part of what we are talking about and where we're going next. But to give us a different light, because Jet has led on both the discussion of the Kingston Harbor fish kill, as well as the Rio Cobra fish kill, and generally about how our sewage treatment plants work or don't work, I'm gonna invite Dr. Teresa Rodriguez Moody to make her presentation. Thank you, Prof, for that introduction. Um, let me share my screen. And uh, let me put it on full. Are you seeing it? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, but I realize that we, okay, good. All right, so um, what I will be talking, good evening, my apologies. Um, thank you for inviting Jet to be a part of this important um, public lecture series. The conversation that I'll be having today is more focused on the Rio Cobra as a case study, as we talk about dirty rivers, dirty water, dirty um, dead fish. Um, and so I will, let me start. As we know, Jamaica is home to many rivers and it provides a variety of services. So that includes your recreational, your livelihood, your water supply for industry, agriculture, domestic purposes, but they're threatened. And they're threatened by a number of things, not only by climate change, not only by sand mining, but also you know, by pollution. So turning our attention to Rio Cobre, um, here's a map that shows um, the extensive system. And it is it really begins in the Vale of Luidas as a very small stream um, known as Murmuring Brook. And it has multiple tributaries that eventually enter into this massive and very important river known as the Rio Cobre. Uh, it's an important source of water for domestic, agricultural, industrial purposes. It supplies between 30 and 40 percent of the fresh water for Spanish Town and St. Catherine, and it supplies water for irrigation purposes for farmers in St. Catherine. It's an important source of protein, an important source of livelihood for hundreds of fishers, that, um, some of which are now registered with the National Fisheries Authority, but not all. And it is, again, as I'd mentioned previously, used for recreational and entertainment purposes. But unfortunately, the river gets a lot of the nasty toxic substances that are either accidentally or purposely discharged. And it, the river has a long history of abuse. Um, and I call it abuse 
um, on purpose. Um, the the toxic discharges that you know they have been allegedly linked to uh, alumina processing plants and its mud stacking plants, and they go back as far as the 1980s. We have more recent examples of these toxic discharges that have resulted in fish kills noted back 2011, 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, and 23. Uh, we have some other, other alleged polluters, including trade winds. Most recently, we heard about the oil spill in the river in December. And others that we know about in terms of the fish kills, but we have not been able to find out or they have not been named in the public domain. Um, and these discharges have resulted in significant impacts to the ecology of the river resulting in death of many organisms, not just the fish, affecting the fishers and all of those who depend on the river. And I've just included a couple of the newspaper clippings of, of previous incidents. NWC, NIC, they've had to shut off their water intake, sometimes forcing people to purchase water. There's a few more that you can see. Now, when we look at the most recent and significant, it's not the most recent, but it is one of the most significant pollution incidents which occurred in 2022, we see the devastation that it caused. We saw that ecological impacts major, you know, people woke up to the sight of thousands of dead fish, small and large, not just fish again, crayfish, uh, you know, the, what they call lobster and some and other organisms, um, loss of livelihood. Uh, we know that fishers earn typically up to $60,000 a month, um, up to sometimes less. It's an average figure. The river was only fully restocked in maybe more. Um, the river was only fully restocked, as far as we understand, in November 2023, and which was more than a year after the incident took place. And fishers have only just started to really get back their livelihoods. We saw that water quality was impacted. NWC, NIC, they weren't able to use the water for irrigation and potable water. A lot of farmers had dead animals, crops were, were damaged, my apologies. And the scale of the economic impact and the cost of the restorative work and social impacts were valued to exceed 200 million Jamaican dollars. And there was an environmental performance bond in place, which was about 115 million um, roughly. And this is Jamaican. And so the cost, the economic cost ex far exceeded this bond that was in place. So you might ask, uh, with this such a large scale impact, what are some of the actions that have been taken? And I'm not just looking at the actions that have just been taken. I want to look at the fact that over the years, the river has been polluted. So what are some of the actions that have been taken? So through ATI requests, we have been able to determine that um, at least six enforcement notices have been issued um, by NEPA between 2011 and 2019. We saw that several other notices um, between 2020 and 2022 were also issued. Um, we see that legal action is being taken by the by NEPA over the 2019, 2021, and 2020 discharge into the river. And I think for the first time, um, there was a drawdown of the environmental performance bond, which is US 771, which is about 115 at the time, $115 million. Now, um, continuing the recent action, we see that again, the minister at the time, Minister Samuda in November of 2022, which is just a couple months after the incident, had indicated that the money or the bond would compensate, would be used for compensation, um, which is it's not really supposed to be used for social support. Um, so 16 million of this was put towards Fisher Folk. Um, but we see that the bulk of the, the compensation package was distributed to three state agencies, including NWC, NIC, and NEPO. And we also know that an assessment of the river was done not by a reg the regulatory body, but by Windalco to inform the restocking of the river, which was then overseen by NEPO. There have been other smaller pollution, not NEPO, my apologies, NFA. Um, and NEPA would have been somehow involved as well. There have been sm several smaller pollution incidents um, that have been reported to us, and we in turn have reported it to the National Environmental Planning Agency. Um, several of these smaller fish kills would have occurred in April and May, and we also knew about the... We also know about the um, the oil spill, which took place in December 2023. Now, are these actions enough? 
Um, you know, a healthy environment is critical to public health and strong sustainable economies. Environmental legislation and regulations are important. They're central in protecting people as well as your plants, your animals, your entire ecosystem that we exist in. And environmental laws are important because they ensure that individuals, governments, and companies do not cause harm. But are these laws enough? Do we have enough laws? What about the monitoring and enforcement of these laws? And here I want to just talk about the fact that, you know, for environmental legislation to work, it must not only be well designed, but it also needs to be efficiently and effectively enforced. Um, there was a study, um, well, studies have shown that um, monitoring and enforcement of laws and policies and regulations in Jamaica is weak, both at the both at the national and local levels. And in a study done by Capri in 2018, they noted that if Jamaica was just to implement the policies that already exist and enforce the laws that already exist, um, environmental protection would be far more effective than it is at present. We also see that there's a serious lack of transparency, public engagement, and access to information. Most of the information that we've had to, um, you know, if you want to find out about the history of what has taken place, enforcement actions, and so forth, you actually have to submit an access to information request. We also identify that um, while, you know, there are no EIA regulations, um, the institutional and regulatory framework is complex and lies with multiple bodies. We see that, yes, there are fines. Um, their fines under the NRC Act and the Wildlife Protection Act are very low, as you can see, 50,000 and 100,000 Jamaican dollars respectively, and have really had little or no impact on behavior. We've had recent promises to increase the fines that were made in 2021 and again in December 2022. So hopefully we'll actually see this realized, this come to fruition. And I can't end without mentioning some recommendations. Um, and so these are recommendations that we have been speaking about quite often, that we need to strengthen the NRC Act. We need to increase the fines and the sanctions. We have to do some rationalization and completion of environmental policies that have lagged and stayed in draft. Um, we need greater transparency and access to information. We, we need to finalize and implement the EIA regulations. I know they're back on the books for working on them. And the new timeline says that they should be completed by December 2025, 20, I believe. Um, greater monitoring and enforcement, greater monitoring and enforcement and compliance is needed. So, for example, the EIA regulations needs to set out a variety of civil, civil and criminal remedies which NRC slash NEPA can pursue where there's a breach of permit um, or where a proponent begins an activity without a permit. So that needs to be set out in the regulations very clearly. And again, I think we can't reiterate that we need to have greater public participation, not greater. And by public participation and engagement, it's not about um, informing the public of what you're doing, but it's engaging the public even greater throughout the entire process, a real participatory approach. And in conclusion, um, our rivers are likely to continue to be threatened by pollution events. Um, if we don't have a greater commitment to execute and complete identified actions, which we have seen as increasing in fines, some of which I've mentioned already, greater and more meaningful public en engagement. If we were to implement these policies that already exist and enforce existing laws, environmental protection of our rivers and of all our water bodies, in fact, will be much more effective than it is at present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez Mule. As usual, very clear and lucid. The comments at the end, I think, are extremely valuable when we talk about what can we do, because you've given us an RCA Act, fines, policies, transparency, EIA regs, which have been out there for a while, as we said, monitoring and public participation and participation in a different way. As an NGO, probably Jamaica's top NGO, you have been participating, and we thank you for that. Questions keep coming, and I think we will have a robust discussion, as I said. But I want to go to an individual who has been participating as a member of the public, and thank him for joining. Mr. Marlon Green is a fisher who is from the Rio Cobra area, has been fishing for over 20 years, 
Um, my notes here say he was taught by his grandmother. So granny teacher, good boss. Started <laughs> yes. fishing at nine years old and prefers to fish in the Rio Cobra. But clearly you've had some difficulties over the last couple of months. Um, you've been fishing in St. Mary, in the ferry, in Portland, and St. Anne. Mr. Green is a member of the Friends of Rio Cobra and brings to us a different dimension in terms of how the community has been impacted. So it's unveiling the devastating impact of water pollution on fisher folk like Mr. Marlon Green. Sir Green? Yes, sir. All right. Um, It's been a, a rough, rough situation because normally most most people who's not working, who live in the Bogwalk, Church Road, Nallis, all in the in this area, would um catch fish from the Rio Cobra. And going to the river, it's like no chance, a very little chance. But then you go river, you can nobody will just say you sit on the pot and go catch the fish and come back. That's not happening anymore. And these these things have been happening from a very long time now. The 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 spill in the water. Never have anyone standing and protesting or any other side. But um, when Mister Garden Keston Garden, he's a member of the Friends of Recovery, and um. Trust me, what he had done and is been doing from then to now, from the starting, it's a good look. Fighting for us, for having a, a freedom in the river, all of those, trust me, it is a good look. But um, that can't change what has been, what has already happened. We would like to move forward in finding um, a way how to, how to stop this from happening again, avoid all of those impact on everybody because trust me, it really hurt a lot of people. Even myself, a few friends of mine, people who I, I haven't even spoke to, like not having an issue, but seeing people at the river, you don't see it anymore. <clears throat> Normally you pass by, um. Breadfruit Gully Bridge, right? And you normally see on the bridge when water dirty, you see like up to 15 different person trying to catch fish. Nowadays, if the water even come down dirty, you don't see, you hardly even see five person that much. So it is a situation where we need the help in order to, I need a, um, a guidance more than, um, more than ever. Mr. Garden is doing a lot, as I said, and, um, we have to be sure that it won't happen again. Cause trust me, it, it, it also pushes a lot of other fishermen to go other places out of Rakobe water to go and dive, including myself and a few other people. Because if we will go to the river and can't find any, what we are going to do? We are going to eventually push going further and further in other places. And um, most of the places are not a safe place to dive, including um, down by ferry. Because we went there a few weeks ago, and trust me, the crocodiles are in the water and they are showing themselves really, really, really. They are not hiding because um, I was told it is mating season and we have encountered with them more than once. So for the past few weeks, I haven't even get the chance to go and dive because in this river, not much. They say, I've yeah, restart the river and <laughs> Trust me, restocking the river is our next thing we um, would like to talk about. Um, if you are restocking the river, I think members of the community should be on board to, um, to show 
and instruct you guys that um like we are the best places we are the breeding ground for the fishes you understand and when it happened i was only told that the river was restocked i was looking forward to um be a part of it i wasn't even aware of it until it happened next thing the type of fish that we used to have in this water, they are not there anymore. I used to fish, um, catch the, the fish they call carp, and 14, up to 15 pound true fish, um, the carp. And trust me, I haven't seen one from the fish kill. I haven't seen not even one. I haven't heard about any restocking of the carp in the water. You have a fish named mullet. I haven't heard about it. There's no mullet in the rear cobra up this side. I'm not sure about way down at the end, ending in Spanish. But there no rear cobra go through Spanish. Stuff. And um, you have sandfish, you have mullet, you have carp, you have tilapia. And the original, the original tilapias, we normally call them black carp. I haven't seen any of those. I haven't seen any rockfish. Um, there's a fish down news called Drama. I haven't seen any of those. So imagine all of those names that have come. And it's just only the, the tilapias alone. Tilapias used to grow up to three pounds because I'm sure fish in there, tilapia. But the carp are one of the main things that grow up to 15, even more. You understand? And um not seeing those fish going to river and shooting fish and not seeing those is it's it's it is not um it's not a good feeling it's not a good feeling and um other people other have to be sourcing other options what about others who can't who don't have the qualification because uh, up until now i know Elderly person, 50 at their wall. I think this lady is more than 50 at 20. But um, you can't seek for her to go and look, seek job. Her livelihood is in the river. She normally would have sit down and catch some fish and she can't sell it. That's not happening for her. So it is a great damage. And um, Mr. Garden. He's trying his best to assist. Trust me, he is. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm lack of words right now, to be honest, because there's so much things to say. So much. The river, the damage of the river. Um, It was a thing where, I don't know, it was before I was born, you know, they used to have even competition to catch fish. That is how things used to be in Bogwalk. They used to have competition done by Barefoot Gully to catch fish. None of that hasn't happened in years. You understand? And I remember when I used to go to river, um, I would have to dig the worm for my grandmother or my uncle. Sometimes my uncle, and when they used to go to the river, and he said, okay, get some worm. We get some worm. And then said, go and go get your line and come back. You know, as a little child, that is joy. Sometimes they come back and go and leave us. Right? The next time they will take us. So I've been doing it from our um in primary school. Yeah, from primary school. And up to last week, I'm in a school group from the Bogwalk High School. I was in the group and one of the classmates of mine remembered and said, ah, if you still do those stuff, and I said, yes, I can't stop, you know. He said to me that, if you remember um, that his family were going to school, always doing that thing. And when he said that to me, you know, he touched, he touched a point where I said to him that, you know, it's not like the, the same as all when we were going to school because it's one of the hardest things now to catch a nice string of fish. 
to even for the household, much less to even sell to customers. You understand? And um, in this time, if if you are not in a different field, you can think about fishing alone. It pushes me where well to do other jobs. I work um, with a company, a JPS contractor. And two, three days pay from that contractor, it would equivalent to one day in the river for me. And trust me, it, it is... It is very, 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 very hurtful. It might not seem that way to a lot of people, but trust me, it does hurt a lot of people. I know people who haven't worked for now. Um, I know myself, they dig sand, feed from the river, and all of that. So imagine, as I said, at an age over 50, you can't expect a person at that age going out seeking employment. Getting job for a person over the age of 50 is very hard. It is very hard for a person. When a person can go out, because right now a pound of fish is for seven hundred dollars. Right? Yeah, at that cheap, trust me, it's seven hundred. And we used to catch fish, like one fish, about four years back, up to four years back, one fish can weigh up to more than a pound. So that can sustain a lot in your pocket. I was living with this um this lady and I uh, wasn't working. Because I on and off I work at the contract, and as I said, and I was living, I was paying rent. And I was living there for two years. And the two years I was living, paying rent, I was fishing, paying rent, providing food, clothes, everything. That can't happen anymore. That can't happen anymore. And... um. The other day, I'm trying to remember exactly word to word what the person had said to me. The other day, the person called and said to me that um, if I have any fish, I said no. The person said, "How comes?" I said, "Um, Joe, to what happened?" They said, "I thought um they had stopped at the river." He said, "Yes, yeah, stuck in the river is one, but um, is what they are stuck in the river with, and how many fish they are stuck in the river." With. So the person asked me, is Alcan, is there a ban on Alcan towards what happened? I said, there should be. I'm not 100% sure. And um, only hopefully it worked out for the best. So, okay. So I said to the person, like, you know, I go by ferry and I catch fish now and then and stuff like that. And the person said, so, why go so far? I said, I can't do any better. That's the one of the nearest place right now where I can go to catch some fish. And um, I was explaining to the person that I've encountered with um, the crocodile over, over nine feet tall, over nine feet tall. And the person was saying that, um, please don't go back because it is dangerous. And I said, I know. But I can't make a promise to somebody that I won't go there. Understand? Because I have bills. This is the pay. livelihood. Right. I have bills to pay. I have, I have a four year old son. Right. And um, in the Iba, he was, he was diagnosed with a thing called ITP. It's a blood where the platelet and Throughout the time when he was in the hospital, he was in COVID. Remember, COVID, we're, we were just coming back from a fish kill, right? No, no work, 
fish kill. Fish was just coming back. And um, throughout COVID, I was fishing the same way. I used to hide, go by the river, find places where I could find a few fish. And trust me, my baby mother have to back and forth every day by children hospital because you could stay on the compound. Right? And um fishing, Mr. Green, I, I would want to thank you for the sharing because you've gone through a lot of you've given us the distressed community part of this discussion in terms of going to the river, seeing people at the river, the freedom to go to the river, um, having to go to other places, having to put greater risk. I mean I think about the crocodiles that you're talking about. And, but I'm also interested in the type of fish. You mentioned about the restocking with the carp, the mullet, the rockfish, yeah. etc. That's something that clearly we're going to need to have a little discussion on. Because we want to come to what can we do. I know that Nepa has done a lot. I know that NFA has done a lot. Um, the question is, what else can we do? And can we take it any further? So I'm going to ask you to hold your thoughts on that. Um, because you've given us some recommendations. I mean, I don't know if anybody has mentioned that ban on Alcan before in that way, but hey, as a man living in the place, doing the fishing, you're speaking your mind, which is kind of why we're having this discussion and why you bring a different perspective. So thank you very much. And um, let's take a few questions after our last presenter. So thank you, Sir Green. Yeah. Colleagues, I want to go to our last presenter, who is Dr. Andre Coy, because while we have heard from both Anjanet and Richard, about what happens with the regulator agencies and what they've been doing. And they clearly have been doing a lot and, and going further. And while Dr. Rodriguez Moody has told us some of the actions and lack of actions, and now we've just heard from Mr. Green. Andre is a senior lecturer in the Department of Physics. Um, and he his research interests span a number of things, but one of the things is signal processing. And I know that he has a strong interest in how we can monitor without having to be there. Because my information says the last fish kill that was in the Rio Cobra, it was a man who is there like Mr. Green, who eventually bring it to Nepa's attention, who then went out there to do something. Is there a way we could 24-hour monitor in the background our engagement of what's happening on the river? So I invite Dr. Andre Coy to share disaster mitigation through automated waterway monitoring. Welcome, Andre. Thank you, Prof. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, Terry, and viewing. So uh, I want to talk to us very briefly about some of the work that has been going on uh, at the University of the West Indies in the Faculty of Science and Technology that we think uh, would be quite useful for uh, dealing with the problems that we're having with dirty water, dead fish, and distressed communities. But before I go into uh, my presentation, I want to uh, mention that the work that I'll be sharing today is the work of uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, um, so I was not involved with the development of this, of this tool. Um, and I want to give uh, credit where credit is due. Dr. Larry Myers, uh, who's a retired senior lecturer in the Department of Physics at UWE, is also a former chief executive of NEPA um, through 2006 to 2009. He was the one who uh, developed the system in conjunction with Dr. Leonard Clark, um, who is a lecturer in the Department of Physics currently, um, and a number of, of students who have gone on to, to sterling uh, careers. And Dr. Jayaka Campbell has revived the project um, and has come up with um, version 2.0 along with some of his students. So credit uh, where credit is is due. We've we've heard already that the issues with uh, waterway pollution and the fact that it is uh, a significant problem in our societies. It's not limited uh, to Jamaica, and the environmental degradation has impacts across the world, wherever that in environmental degradation takes place. But more importantly, um, or maybe not more importantly, but uh, definitely linked to it and caused by it is the economic loss. We, we heard a while ago uh, a real story, uh, and this is just one of many. So I don't need to spend much time trying to convince you about the, the dangers and the, the problems with pollution. 
But one of the, the issues that occurs is that the, the timely uh, detection of these pollutants in our waterways has eluded us so far. There are uh, solutions that have been put forward. I, I heard the solution from NEPA where there is a, a citizen um, monitoring uh, approach that is being taken, and, and that's an excellent idea. And But we, we need to think further as to how we can do this without actually having to send people to go out and to measure things, having to uh, wait for somebody to, to have credit to make a phone call. This is, is a challenging area for us. And this is something that we believe uh, in the Faculty of Science and Technology, which is the place to go for science and technology information and solutions is that we can do something a little bit different, something that will allow us uh, to, to do this kind of monitoring that is required, to engage in this kind of uh, <clears throat> oversight um, in a way that is uh, that can be done remotely, in a way that is uh, quick, that is on, online and always available. And so we have proposed, uh, have developed um, and in the past have used uh, a waterway monitoring solution that will allow for uh, constant monitoring, that will allow for uh, all the stakeholders to be involved um, through being able to access the information in real time and, and therefore being able to act on it in real time. And so the proposed solution uh, developed by my colleagues um, is the real TMS. This is a, a water monitoring and alert system that will uh, allow for the constant um, real-time monitoring of our waterways. It consists of a network of sensors, and these will measure a, a wide variety of environmental uh, parameters. It can be in a still uh, body of water, can be in a moving body of water. This information is relayed um, to a cloud-based, uh, an online storage system, that information is then displayed uh, to the users um, of the system. And so it provides them with information uh, that they can act on. This information can be uh, accessed via the internet. So this is uh, an image or a couple of images showing um, how the first system was deployed. Um, this was actually deployed for a private sector partner. They were very pleased with the results uh, and it was quite effective. And this was done uh, many years ago. And uh, so it was more than just a proof of concept. It was actually a deployment. And so we know that this uh, can work. We know that this will provide us with the tools that we need to make the decisions uh, that we have to make and to get things uh, done very quickly. This is an image of the current dashboard, um, one of the pages. So it can show you where the sensors are located. You can click on a sensor. It will give you the information for that station, um, showing all the parameters uh, that are being monitored. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And you can make your interface as a user, if you have a particular need, you can actually make your, your interface specific to you so that it will display only what you want displayed or will display additional information uh, to that which is uh, given to the average user. This can be put in all uh, the waterways that are of concern. Um, it can be put at the, uh, in areas that need to be monitored constantly. And so when events occur, it doesn't take us a day or two. We don't have to wake up in the morning to see that something has occurred uh, overnight. We can get an alert um, that something has occurred and investigations and mitigation uh, can begin. So a uh, quick overview uh, of the, the new system. So the data are gathered and they're stored uh, online. So there's historical data as well. So you can do your analytics. You can see um, where there's, there's, most, uh, there's most of an issue. Um, you can determine that these areas need to be monitored more closely. Actions need to be taken in this particular region. Whatever uh, needs to be done, uh, you can have the data to make those decisions. It's designed to be modular. 
And so you can uh, move it around. Uh, you can uh, uh, measure uh, things that are specific to your environment that don't come with the, the generic system. It's easy to maintain. Um, and you can have a quick response time uh, of the sensors. So you don't have to wait an hour for an update. You get really quick updates on what is going on. And it's meant uh, to uh, foster communication. So it allows for quick transmission of data um, uh, and it's available for all uh, to see, those who are registered um, to the Real TMS website. I won't dwell too long on, 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 on this, um, but the idea is a number of parameters are monitored. Um, and if you're thinking about a fish kill, one of the, the major indicators is going to be the amount of dissolved oxygen in, in the water. And so if there's an alert about uh, a reduction in dissolved oxygen, then you know quickly that, okay, that this is something that needs urgent attention. Other parameters uh, can be monitored as, uh, as desired by, by a client. The maintenance period is uh, approximately one to three months. Um, it depends on the water quality. It depends on the, the salinity of the water, all of, all of those things. Sensors need to be changed um, approximately once a month, some sensors, and then you'll need to clean, clean the probes. But this can be a, a part of a routine monitoring uh, exercise, as is already done, um, as, as our colleague from NEPA uh, indicated. There is regular monitoring uh, of the waterways. And so the uh, maintenance of these sensors, of these probes can be done um, during a regular maintenance uh, schedule. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the future, the, the work that needs to be done um, is to develop a mobile application. So not only uh, will we have access to the data uh, on our PCs and on our laptops, but we will be able to monitor this um, using our phones. Um, storing of samples, if there is a, a need where you see, uh, let's say a particular parameter spikes or falls below um, the level that you expect it, the system can be instructed to store um, a sample of water, <clears throat> excuse me, so that that can be uh, further analyzed um, for other pollutants uh, and just to see what is going on. Uh, in the area. And then we need to, to uh, add some sensors, um, things that are not uh, necessarily pollution indicating, but that give valuable information um, for stakeholders. Currently, um, the system uh, is not self-powered. And so uh, an update to this would allow for um, self-powering of the system. And so, as I end, uh, I want to encourage us to think about uh, partnering with the Faculty of Science and Technology, because uh, I believe that this uh, solution is one that can take us a far away into um, solving some of the problems that we're having um, with monitoring, with uh, quick action, with being able to uh, alleviate suffering uh, and to um, mitigate economic loss and environmental degradation. So our, our private sector partners, our NGO partners, our members of the public, all are welcome um, to, to work with us so that we can move forward um, in mitigating uh, these disasters by using the solution like the real TMS. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Coy, and thank you for the information you've shared and the opportunities. And thank all our presenters for having shared their thoughts, their visions. So it's up to question and discussion time. And I have a number of questions. In fact, I have a question for each presenter, and then I have some questions that have no owners that you might have to tell me where you want to go. So let's start in the order that we came. And Jeanette, I have a question here that says, you spoke of partnerships. In fact, all of you spoke about partnerships. The question to NFA, can you give an example of an academia partnership and did it involve research? An academia partnership? Yes. Okay. That, that, that a whole lot has passed through my mind. Um, <laughs> specifically, um, I can say for, if I can use my own case, I mean, we would have partnered with 
the university, well, the University of the West Loop definitely is one of our academic partnerships. And we have done collaborative work in terms of the board. This is not def definitely speaking to uh, the rivers, but uh, as it relates to conch surveys, we would have done that in times past. And um, the conch, the queen conch, is one of those fisheries that are, are under the CITES I watch, if you will. Um, so we have to manage it very closely. And every year, or every three to five years, we would execute what we call a underwater visual survey. And we have partnered with the university um, many a times um, in executing this task and to determine the stock status of the um, of the conch species. And then by extension, be able to determine what is the total allowed catch that may be implemented. So that's just one example that readily comes to mind. Thank you. Let me have my follow-up question. I guess as moderator, I can throw these in. So in your fisheries management, do you have some of the species that Mr. Green talked about as part of your management framework, the carp, the mullet, the rockfish, the drummer? Is that something that fish NFA has as a part of its mandate or it really is marine fisheries only? We have it all in compacting, but um, I would say that specifically there is no fishery management plan yet in place for what he would have mentioned. I took note keenly of what um, Mr. Green had mentioned. Um, and yes, I, I do emphasize with what Mr. Green had said in terms of um, what was restocked. And we do take note of what you had said. And um, we definitely had placed in there the black perch and the red tilapia and the rocky mountain. Those were species that we cultivated and we would have facilitated at the, the aquaculture division. So the ones that he would have mentioned, um, as I said, he took note of, and I think this is something that we can definitely embark on as part of our new thrust as a, as a NFA to even to consider for further restocking to meet the needs. Thank you. And I think part of what we want to get from this discussion is the need for that partnership to go beyond where it was. Both Theresa and Marlon spoke about the need for for the partnership to be not just uh, 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 you telling them. It has to be an engagement. I mean, if you we really should ask Marlon what fish he wants in there, what fish does the fisher folk want, and what has worked and not worked, rather than fishing it with something that either they're not going to catch or something that is unlikely to survive. So, But we'll take that one a little further. Uh, Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Anjanette. No, I was about to say that um, I'm not sure if Mr. Green, if you were there, but community meetings have been had with, I mentioned earlier about our compliance officers. So they have been going in and having more focused discussions, um, group discussions. And uh, part of the restocking exercise did actually take into consideration some consultation with officials. So I'm not sure if it was one of those times, because I know sometimes when you go to meet, not everybody will be present at the time, but we'll definitely tighten up on our collaboration. Okay, great. Thank you. Richard, I have a question for you. It is kind of tied into where Andre took us a while ago. What about using technology to detect pollution before it spreads too far? Is the human detection the best we can do? All right. And, you know, I, I'm very glad for that question. And first of all, Andre, I should tell a very good presentation. And it fits right into the agency's plan with the early warning system. Those signs are basically the low-hanging fruits. In fact, we started to do some inquiries about using electronic electronic system um, to give us, you know, early warning. We 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 had met with some stakeholders who already use a type of early warning system to notify. So, for example, you know that um, for ADPEM and the RA, there's a early warning system about flooding. Um, so what? From when I was sitting here, I said, well, after this discussion, I need to get your contact so I can have that discussion with my director because this is something, when I look at what was presented in, in, your, in your, what it can do, I'm very encouraged. And yes, uh, Prof, this is something the agency will um, explore. I think we have a solution right here. Um, it's apparently based on a presentation that's been tried and proven. And um, it is something we're going to. We also thought about the use of, um, some cameras. In fact, when we had a community meeting in putting this early warning system together, it involves stakeholder engagement. And when we met with the communities, the fisher folks, 
a few of them did indicate that, you know, if you put some cameras where, you know, somebody's monitoring at least, most times the pollution in, in, the, in the river, and we're talking here in Oriacor, it's a visual thing. And so the camera will be able to pick it up and you can respond in a timely manner. Unfortunately, though, they, what the early warning system is going to do, it is going to tell you that a pollution incident has occurred. What we really want is that the mechanisms are in place at those facilities that when there's an offset in their system, their discharges are contained or there's some you know, redundancy in place to prevent any discharge to our water body. So not only with the communities that we're working, we're also working with the, with the, the, um, the various facilities along the right workers in this particular case. Um, because there are about three industrial areas along the right over. And unfortunately, their discharge goes to the right over. And so we are not working with them to see how best we can minimize that. But yes, we are pretty much in for the technology and it is a part of our long term plan. But we need to get something done on the ground so we start with low iron fruits. Well, start at the beginning and work your way up. But I have a follow up question which comes up for you then. You mentioned it and so did Dr. Rodriguez Modi. Fifty thousand and a hundred thousand dollars is not a fine. I mean, that's really ridiculous. As a, what can you do to move that fine? Because you talk about the polluter pay principle, but I'll be honest. You just mentioned two or three of the industries. A hundred thousand dollar fine is twenty minutes of their industry working. What's a real fine, and how do we get there? Well, currently the fines are being reviewed, um, and it is something. The, the thing is that it has to go through a process. You know, we. The legal team meets, they look at the, the, the various fines. Um, it has to now go to the minister and then it goes from there to chief parliamentary council and so forth. It is well on, well far down the wicket now, if I use that term. Um, however, as we would have loved the fines though, to be very large, but again, that is going to be limited by some other factors external to network. But yes, we agree, $50,000, $100,000, not cutting it, but we are looking at fines, I think. I mean, if memory serves me correctly, we are looking at fines as much as $5 million. Um, But I must just say one thing, though. Um, we'll talk about partnership, and we have done this before, and um, it's something we will explore. So while the NRCA fines are very low, the Fisheries Act carry very hefty fines. And, you know, there is room where we can do a uh, what you call a prosecution where they, they, the perpetrators can be prosecuted using both pieces of legislation so you get a stronger, stronger um, fine. Which is but, where partnership is essential. Okay. Um, Teresa, I have a question for you. It says, if there was one law gap that you would want to see urgently addressed or closed, what would that one thing be? Why? It's a tough one. One. <laughs> I know you have like a dozen, but yes, one. So if, if you had to pick one for us to put all our efforts at, towards, what would it be? And of course, why? Um, I don't know if monitoring and enforcement is going to count as a gap, as a law gap, but it's like it's a huge weakness that comes up time and time again. And you can lump a lot of things under that. We talk about what you just spoke about with the fines, um, with the fact that you know, the systems that are in place to report, the reporting mechanisms need improvement and so forth. Um, it, I, I feel like that, I wouldn't want to propose something new. Uh, yes, we know that EIA regulations are needed and they're coming, but if we don't do that follow up and follow through with the enforcement, the monitoring and so forth, then I just don't think it's, it's going to be as effective as we want it to be. Okay. I, I, I sense where you're going and I realize that there it's hard to nail down one, but yes, the monitoring is a major problem enforcement. I mean, I keep telling from, from the lectures I give in, in coastal management and environmental management, we don't need more legislation. No, no, we need more enforcement of the legislation that's there. Um, so let's see how we go with that. The follow-up question, of course, um, comes to you as well, Teresa, is, so there are bonds that are associated with some of these activities. And you talked about 
some of the bonds being activated. But it didn't sound like the bond went to benefit much of the environment. It went to specific government entities. The question is, do the bonds just move money around between government agencies and not benefit the environment? Well, first of all, I'd like to know how we come up with these bonds um, because, and we've tried to get this information again through the access to information and we just haven't been able to find out. Um, so the mechanism of how it is calculated and how it is determined, you know, in, in terms of this distribution. Um, and one of the things that we clearly learned through this rear cobra exercise is that um, the bond was never intended for social support, meaning compensation to fishers. And even when the fishers received compensation, they didn't call it compensation. It was a grant. And then the fishers in turn had to sign a deed of indemnity, um, indemnifying the government from taking, um, you know, in terms of, you know, they can't take any further legal action if they take this money. So um, I, I think that, in, in terms of the 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 amount of the bond, um, how the bond is distributed, we need. I remember I mentioned about transparency. We need to have a better understanding of how these things are calculated. How you come up with the cost in the first place, because you have to value the environment. You have to value something. Um, you have to value the cost of a potential impact of the potential impacts, and then how you decide who gets the bulk of the money and those who need it the most. Why can't they benefit from it? Um, if you need to put something else in place, then what is that going to be called? And what is that mechanism? So all of that transparency and um, all of that needs to be done going forward. Very true, and and putting a value on not just the resource of what is there of the fish, but there's a value of uh, Mr. Green mentioned in terms of the, the pleasure of the pleasure of fishing. There's so many other things to put in that valuation, not just the the item of the fish. I mean, I hear the seven hundred dollars a pound, um, Sir Green, but um, there's a lot more in there that needs to be taken into consideration. So thank you, Sir Green. Your question comes up: Do you think the penalties now in place for polluters are sufficient? If not, what would you want to see? I see you smiling. Unmute and tell me. You have to unmute. You're muted. Yeah. All right. The penalty. Well, first of all, you think it, you think the penalty is enough now, right now? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> My so thing what is, you want to see? when you think about the penalty, you, you, you um, hearing hearing the penalty, you don't even want to make a slight mistake. That is my thing. I don't think, I don't feel suitable with it. I think it should enforce a bit more. So you think it should be a larger penalty and more rigorously enforced? Yes. All right. Second follow up question for you, of course, is about the restocking. And the question is, if you were in charge of the restocking exercise, what would you want restocked in the Rio Cobra? And where would you restock it? Because I gather where you put it is important based on the river continuum that you have. What what fish you would use and where would you start? What fish? There are at least five different species of fish. As I'll mention, the mullet, the carp, the um the drummer, the, the, the sunfish, the rockfish. Um, the, the, the next thing is um the, the red tilapia. Those fish cannot manage the the every the, the um the hard life in the river. Life hard in the river? Those fish those fish are not going to be able to manage the water. No. Okay. And second um, where I would stop the fish. Yeah. There are numerous amount of places. You have to stop. You have to stop fish way up in the river. Furthermore, way up from Zephyrton, come right down. You have um near where the every spring. Including Ben Macanel and Macanel premises, there are more than one place there. And um in Bogwalk, in Barefoot Gully area, those are the places. You go at um Ken Village, 
below Ken Village, right between Pimrock, Rubiscana, Flatbridge, Akiwak, Damed, and continue go down. You have to stop the fish. As it would have to be an organization where people come together, where everybody voice their opinion in a mannerable way, so you can understand what that person saying, that person experience, and all that. So, okay, so doing that, you will have all the information that you literally need because one person can cannot come up with all the ideas of where to put the fishes. Well, I fully agree with you. And I think that's why Anjanet was talking about the, the meetings that were held. Uh, but it probably needs to be a wider cross-section to exactly. get the inputs that we're talking about. All right, thank you. Dr. Coy, your question on, on the burner is... So the data that comes out from the, um, the the mechanism with the continuous sampling, one, is it open access? Meaning, is it software that somebody needs to now go buy or is it um, freeware? And two, how much does it cost to develop it? Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, so before I answer your question, I wanted to to make another shameless plug uh, for the Faculty of Science and Technology. I heard well, is, 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 is our program in us or is not shameless? Do you think? Yes, I heard uh, Mr. Nelson saying that they're considering putting up cameras um, in the uh, in some of the the waterway areas um, that would need to be monitored. Um, again, if you don't have the human resource to do that, um, Dr. Paul Gaynor. Uh, in the Department of Computing in the Faculty of Science and Technology actually uh, does work on uh, event detection from video. So uh, you could have your, your uh, video stream uh, automatically monitored as well if you uh, get in touch with, with Dr. Gaynor. I'm sure he would be willing to um, discuss that with you. Uh, to your question, Prof, um, the, the, the data, uh, we believe in, in the free access of data. Um, and so uh, I don't want to speak for the team um, that's working directly on this, but I suspect that there will be uh, mechanisms where data can be made available uh, for uh, non-commercial purposes, for instance, if you want to do research um, or if an NGO wants this to, to help with their, their uh, decision making. Uh, the cost, uh, again, that is uh, up to the team, but in, in discussions I had um, with Dr. Campbell earlier today, um, it didn't seem to be an extremely expensive um, undertaking. Um, and, and the time uh, for, for full rollout um, is, is relatively short as well. We're talking about a, man, uh, a manner of months um, from procuring the, the, the pieces of, of hardware um, and putting together um, a module to be, to be deployed. Okay. So if you put the packet rollout, um, we, could, we could do that uh, as well. I see Richard not at him head sound like you have some business coming your way. But two follow-up questions that come from that is, so you mentioned it's a one to three months monitoring or, or, um, in terms of the, the, of the maintenance exercise. Who would you propose to take charge of the monitoring and maintenance? Who would be the best entity to do so? And of course, why? Right. So I, I heard Mr. Nelson talking about uh, monitoring in his presentation. They already uh, NEPA go out and, and monitor the, the waterways um, in the areas of interest. So I, I would uh, think that NEPA uh, could work to, to do this monitoring as well. Of course, um, the university, uh, the Faculty of Science and Technology is willing to do the training necessary, is willing to provide some support. But uh, I think as the agency with responsibility for the monitoring and as an agency that's already undertaking some amount of monitoring, uh, NEPA would be best placed um, to do that. Okay, point taken. And the last question that is there for you is, I suppose it links to, to Mr. Nelson as well. Are the parameters that you have identified overlapping sufficiently with the parameters from NEPA for their trade effluent standards, their um, ambient water quality standards? Are you are you sampling the right things is what the question is asking. And I suppose, uh -huh. Richard, you can answer that as well. Andre. That's an excellent question. Um, so the initial development was done by the then CEO of NEPA, um, Dr. Larry Maris. Larry, 
Right. So he would have he would have gone into this knowing what needed to be monitored and understanding that those are the things that he would want in the system. So I think in part, um, many of those parameters are already uh, being monitored. Um, it, uh, Mr. Nelson can tell us if they're all being monitored, but I think that uh, many of them already are. Um, and thank, thank you again. Um, from your presentation, I made some notes and I realized you have pH, you have dissolved oxygen, uh, temperature, electrical conductivity, turbidity. Now, um, when we do a water quality monitoring, there are some, what I, I like to call key criteria parameters. And you have here one, two, three, four of them, right? Uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, um, electrical conductivity. And those will give us an idea, especially if they are industrial discharges. Conductivity is a key parameter that you want to look at. Um, fecal, when we when we look at, again, pollution in rivers, we also think about public health, as Mr. Green said, you know, the, the river is also used for recreational purposes. And so the whole issue of uh, fecal coliform is something that we look at. Now, it is not here. However, there's a direct link with fecal coliform and dissolved oxygen. Because if you have a proliferation of, of um, bacteria, then you may have, you know, utilization of um, of the of, of oxygen in the water. Again, also you don't have nutrient. That's something we look at. But there's a proxy: dissolved oxygen. Too much nutrient, you are going to eventually see a dissolved oxygen. Level. So yes, so far, um, what I'm seeing it's something useful. It I hear he said that it can be it can be part me from wrong. Based on what we want, it can probably be modeled to that to meet that. So that's right. Yes, definitely. What I I can say for sure, probably there is going to be a discussion with the agency and and the faculty of science, which I'm not sure where this is going to. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, colleagues. So that is one question that has come for each person. So as sure. I said, there are a couple of questions that you can now say if you want them. Andre, you wanted to comment. Sure. Um, just quickly again, um, Dr. Uh, Debbie Ann Gordon-Smith in the Department of Chemistry. Chemistry at the FST does a lot of work in water management and in, in discharge. So I heard you mention um, uh, fecal coliform. Dr. Myers used to talk about that all the time. Uh, and I'm sure that um, Dr. Gordon-Smith would be willing to have a discussion with you about helping to, to monitor uh, and to test for that in, in water. Okay, thank you. And there are a couple other sources that I will come back to um, as we try to wrap up. But here's an open-ended question, and I don't know who wants to take it. It says, what has been the source of the most recent fish kills in the harbor and in the Rio Corbe? What, what is the source? Has that been released? I guess that's a NEPA question. Richard, what do you say? Um, the, so let me start with Kingston Abel. Um, during the November, into December period, there were a number of fish kills. And again, we work with UWI in trying to assist with coming up what could be the possible cause. And what, what we know for sure, it is the uh, proliferation of algal that led to algal bloom. And in fact, I think, I can't remember the name of the algae at the moment. Was I going to help you in a few seconds? Was my, that, my office, my lab did that. And it is it is not any one particular cause for the bloom, but it's a combination of factors that would include nutrient, temperature, etc., things like those. And as a result of that, this leads us to what we like to refer as non-point sources, right. where you can't really identify any one particular source, and so you have to look at non-point sources. As for the riot cobra, um, the most recent kills. Um, Basically, we're, we're, uh, as Dr. Modi had in our presentation, um, the facilities for which were identified, uh, we're actually in portrait with them. And so those sources were really linked to industrial discharge. Okay. So the, the species you're talking about, so the, the, the fish kill in the harbor, I can tell you, because as I said, it was done by the Center for Marine Sciences and the Department of Life Sciences, our parent department. One of the fish kills was seratium, which is an alga which um, blooms when a certain combination of nutrients are available. And that combination of nutrients usually comes with sewage. So while you can't, you have a non-point source, 
It could be diffuse sewage. It could be from a sewage treatment plant. But that's that's one a way of trying to, to identify. And that was a fish scale. Not so much, but I'll mention the other one in a second. This is a fish scale that actually clogged the gills of the fish so they couldn't breathe anymore. And that's the end of that. The one that was further in the harbor or was from another um, fighter plant called Nitschia, which covered the water surface, um, cut the oxygen, both coming into the water and oxygen being used up by organisms there. So again, that's a non-point source. That one is not so much sewage. That's a number of other um, trigger factors, but you do have a non-point source, especially in such a large body of water. However, the ones that I have heard about and read about from the Rio Cobre were not so much algae. Those sound to be chemical of origin, which means, as you say, you have your finger on the pulse and should know the one or two. I mean, Mr. Green, tell us who you think is responsible for one of them. I don't know if he has more evidence that he wants to share with you. Maybe you can put a camera at Mr. Green place, Andre, so that you can see and pass it on to Richard. I write that as a recommendation. But it is clear that it has happened in the past. What we need to know is how can we avoid it happening again? Because we keep on talking about clean up and restocking and, and how can we prevent it from happening? Any ideas? Any takers? All right. Um, I think I'll, I'll take this first. Um, so with the recent incidents along the right book, um, the agency has now been charged with implementing some measures. Um, one of them is early warning system. Um, the other is to revisit all the industrial facilities along the, the, um, the port of the right Cobra and work with them to come up with a solution to minimize the, the, um, their discharges to the right Cobra. So for example, well, facilities that have an abundance of, of um, lands, farming lands, consideration could be given to treat your, their waste to meet the irrigation standards and redivert it there. Um, there is also the view that we could probably look at aquifer recharge. So we were working with the double area and so forth. So one, the, one of the, the idea is that we try to minimize those into the right cover. Um, as I said, the early warning system is there, you know, and that is to minimize impact downstream and so forth. And maybe a quick response. I, I, I can add here, for example, the recent oil spill in right cover. Really, which not, was not a deliberate discharge, but more of an accident, but it eventually reaches the right over. Because of the quick action by the resident, um, as Mr. Green spoke, we were able to take some action to minimize the discharge. Um, what you, what you see in the videos and what come, what is in circulating in social media is a drop in the bucket to what actually is contained based on the intervention, right? And you know, we really are grateful for those quick responses. The agency is also mandated to do more stringent monitoring of the right over. And again, here we are now and seeing where um Andre, your 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 solutions will help. But we we have now established a working group with the Ministry of Health, NWC, NIC in doing water quality monitoring on a more regular basis so that I mean, currently NEPA does it on a quarterly basis. And then what we find is that um, Ministry of Health does it. The NIC does it almost every day because they take water off and NWC does it almost every single day. They may not do all the parameters at the one, but we have now developed a memor memorandum of understanding amongst ourselves to work out a program where we'll have very, very regular monitoring. When I said regular, um, maybe as much as weekly monitoring of record and we exchange data and so we'll see um, fluctuations in various parameters. The idea of that is, you know, at least we can see what the health of the right over is. I must add here, um, from an enforcement perspective, we have taken action, for example, where UC Russell, which is one of the main source of industrial effluent into the right over, over the years, we have mandated them to put certain measures in place. And um, one of that included the the, the increase in capacity to store effluent that runs off from there as well as waste, um, what to call the red mud, um, red mud bed. Uh, they had an, an EHP that has a capacity, had a capacity of uh, 860 
thousand cubic meters. And be, and since Nepal has taken some action, they have increased that capacity by building an additional storage of 660,000 cubic meters. Um, during the last rainy period we have last year, we monitored it very well. And, um, well, we did not see any impact from it. They were able to manage what they have. Um, notwithstanding, and I'll put it here, if we do have severe storm, I doubt very much that the storage will hold that. But of course, with all of that rain, the, the, the impact will be less, not what you see in the past when there's very little rain. So there are some things that we are doing from the agency side. Okay, thank you. All right, I have a two-part question here, well, a two-person question here, which is for Anjanet and Teresa. So, Anjanet, they, Richard mentioned that the Fisheries Act might actually have more teeth than the NEPA Act, but we can work together in prosecuting. What is the maximum fine on the Fisheries Act, and how does one engage it? How do you enforce it? Okay, so... I was uh, thanking you for that, Prof, because I wanted to point out the fines that we have. So in our schedule, um, the fourth schedule, it points out all of the, the, the fines that can be assigned in our act. And just to point out, for example, in section 20, 22, that talks about the failure to notify the authority when there is um, any deposit on the de deleterious substance, if you're talking about the tune of $3 million within the parish code. If it goes outside of the realms of the parish court, or I should say also the two years in prison, if you go beyond that, then you're talking about a fine to be determined can go beyond the three million um, by the Supreme Court, and they can have up to three years in prison. So fines range here, two, three million dollars in parish court, and it can go beyond that if it escalates to the Supreme Court. Um, we have, as I said, our legal department out again, um, and sure, certainly enough engaging the CEO and his his designate, then they can actually um, move move any matter or in case thereof. Excellent, thank you. So the fifty thousand and hundred thousand is on its way yeah. out, and you're giving right. So Richard, Richard and NRCA's NEPA yeah. some some idea as to where they need to set their goals. So the follow up question that switches to Theresa is: Do you think that the Jamaican judiciary legislatory operation is sufficiently knowledgeable about the impact of these spills and these discharges to implement. So if it goes before a judge, is he, got, is, is he or she going to get a slap on the wrist from the judge to say, all right, next time just don't discharge that way? Or are they, they sufficiently cognizant of how bad the damage is so that they, we can count on the judges to put the $3 million fine out there? That's a big question. <laughs> That's why um, it's for the big lady. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would never presume to know the, the, the breadth of knowledge that the judicial system knows. But I do know that, for example, um, in the, 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 the field of lawyers, you very you it, those that are practicing the environmental environmental law, they're very few. Yeah. Um in terms of and even when we have conversations with lawyers in terms of um the implications of you know different things related to fish kills and you know they have questions sometimes people ask us about bioaccumulation and while that might be relevant for heavy metals it may not be relevant for something else that is for example um, that dissolves very quickly. So um, unless they have a science background, I don't think that they would have the breadth of knowledge necessarily um, that may be needed. And, you know, a couple of years ago, JET had embarked on a program that we had worked with lawyers, judges, in terms of just simply giving them more information and knowledge. And this was specifically in relation to biodiversity. And again, we're doing it again. Now we're looking at um, this. We're starting a new project um, where we're, we're focusing on climate justice, climate change issues. And we're working with the lawyers and um, we'll be working hopefully with judges, the law students and so forth to give more information. And because it's not something that they would necessarily be sitting down to um, properly understand because it may not be something that uh, meet that they, they are that are is put before them. 
um, on a daily basis. So I think that they would have to, like everybody else, would have to um, be informed um, and get some robust, get more, much more information as it relates to any specific um, topic. But everybody needs the needs to even even in this room in, in you know in this conversation um i'm hearing i'm hearing different things being said and i'm hearing um that some people didn't know about this and so forth so we all have gaps in our knowledge base that we need to we would have to work on when we're making any decisions going forward excellent and at least to the next comment that came in as a current kind of comment question um i have a colleague who's asking me on my whatsapp JET used to have a school environment network. Is educating the next generation a part of the way forward? Yeah, we used to have a school's environment program, and right now we haven't been able to do it because of funding. But one of the things that we have recognized, even with this community, working with the, Rio, the Friends of the Friends of the Rio Cobra, um, which is that community group that has been formed coming out of the Rio Cobra Fish Scale, um, they will tell you, and, and this is not just related to the community in um in Bogwalk and Kent Village and so forth. This is island wide. If you don't have a knowledge, if you don't have the information, if you don't have knowledge of the law, for example, if you don't have knowledge of the consequences, um, and who to call and so forth, what tends to happen is a throw hand up in the air kind of situation. And I saw it's always big, it's always been like this, and the things, the, the issues continue. So Yes, it is very important to have ed environmental education at the school level, yes, but also at the community level, because more communities that are empowered with knowledge, empowered with that understanding that polluting my river is not okay, polluting my air is not okay, because I have a right to a healthy environment, then they are, and, and then they are better able to take action even though legal action is sometimes out of their reach because of funds, but at least they have knowledge of the different routes that they could possibly take. Very well said. Colleagues, we are almost at the end. I'm going to ask each of you for a one-minute closing statement in the same order that we went through. What would you want those listening to this session? I mean, the faculty puts together these meetings, these sessions where we get the, the right minds in the in the right room. Um, and the public lecture series is meant to turn what we have. I mean, universities like ours, we're not meant to keep information. It's meant to turn inside out so that we can show what we have. And I think we have a good balance of that here today. People are therefore listening and want to know, what can we do? What's your closing one minute? Anjanette. Okay, thank you so much. I think we have said quite a bit um, in this discussion here, and I think one of the pull away or takeaway from the NFA standpoint, um, we will continue definitely on our trajectory of collaboration. And this platform has allowed us to see even more so how we can improve on our collaboration in, in particular to the management of our rivers. And so one of the thought processes that will be going in our recommendation is to look at a task force um, as we're strengthening our consultations and monitoring the river, we want to see if we can do something like a task force, have our ecosystem-based approach to management or agriculture division to look back into reproducing carbs, the tilapia, the mullets, as uh, Mr. Green would have mentioned before, because these are species that used to um, be produced. And so I will then say from here, thank you. This will definitely move us into a further our direction where we can now build a better fisheries sector for our family. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Ms. Murray. Very well said. Mr. Nelson, All what's right. your one minute takeaway? My one minute. Um, but before, well, in my one minute, I'll say that you have the question about the judiciary and their knowledge of environment laws. And I thought that was a very good point, Yuri. I must say that there were two occasions when NEPA had um, engage them at the Judiciary Symposium. One of them, I remember, was a couple of years ago. But it's very difficult to get them all at the same time. But I remember that Judiciary Symposium, the then Chief Justice, prior to the one that is there, turned to me at lunch table and said, Mr. Nelson, tell me something. When the cut of a crocodile tail, does it continue like our lizard move on? And I said to her, nope. I know what I said to myself. The next person we bring in front of her for cutting off a crocodile tail will have a different 
um, decision against him. But for the reverse, or reverse, what can we do? Dr. Moody, she raised the concerns or the, the views about enforcement. And at NEPA, our enforcement branch is only about 25 of us for the entire island. So we can't do it alone. We need an integrated approach. And one of the best set of persons to assist the agency in enforcement is our stakeholders on the ground. And what I want to see, especially for the rifle, as we chart forward with this protection of the rifle for generations to come, is a good working relationship with the stakeholders on the ground, with the NGOs that are supporting them and so forth, so that we achieve that common goal of ensuring that water is life and we can um, keep it that way. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sir Nelson. Dr. Rodriguez, Moody, what are your closing thoughts? All right. We have a right to a healthy environment, but not a lot of people know this. And we need to empower people with the knowledge that it is a constitutional right and that they need to um, know this and what are the actions that they can take. I think it's very important that we be less reactionary. And a lot of the things that we heard that are now being put in place are for things that should have been done years ago because these industries are not new. Many of them have been there for decades. And so these things have should have been done and should have been in place from before. Um, I do also strongly believe that we just heard Nepa say about working better with stakeholders I mean, I mean, I'm just in a simple WhatsApp group with members of the community. And as soon as they see something, they send a WhatsApp and somebody sends it to NEPA, somebody else sends it to an NFA. And then we just, you know, another one sends it maybe to the minister. And we're like, hey, you know, let's follow up. And then it's a hustle, hustle. It's just a simple WhatsApp group. Um, now, yes, it's not perfect. And yes, you can do, you have your most automated services, um, automated systems in place, but I do believe that if we start with the low-hanging fruits, we can have a much better um, approach to managing of our rivers. And again, I think, and I said it in the presentation towards the end, one of the most important things that we need to change is um, a commitment to execute and complete these identified actions, the greater needs for the law, the, the, the fines, the sanctions, the policies, the transparency, access to information. If we have that commitment to making that, to doing that, then I think that we'll see a massive improvement in the protection, not just of our rivers, but in terms of our entire um, and our environment. Thank you very much. Clear and again, well spoken. So Green, as a fisher in the area and friends of the Rio Cobra, what is your last minute takeaway for us? Unmute. Yeah. From where we're coming from to where we are at now, um, I'd like to, Mr. Garden, a big thank you, big thanks. And um, thanks to Fisheries, NEPA, and all who on board, and all who see the struggle, the smaller persons are going through. And um. I would like to say, working together, hearing the voice of everybody, come to a nice strategic um, ideas. Hearing the voice of everybody, think about what to be done next and move forward by dealing with it in a, in a mannerable way as, as, as it should. And, um, just... Just that much, to be honest. That, that's good. And, and, and you're at the source of a lot of that discussion because you realize every speaker is talking about greater community engagement. And you are the community that needs to be engaged. So thank you. Dr. Coy, what's your last minute? Yes, bro. So three things. Partnership, partnership, partnership. Um, okay. <laughs> the, uh, there are a lot of uh, institutions um, that have this uh, one-off engagement with the Faculty of Science and Technology. So if there is something to, to look at in the immediate, then we, we move to, to contacting the faculty and we get it done and we move on until the next time that there's something to do. But I think if we have this continuous engagement um, with um, science and technology, um, because there's a lot that the faculty knows, 
Um, and if we don't know, we know who to ask. There's a lot that the faculty does in the space of the environment and using science and technology um, to monitor, to, to, to make things better, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to improve um, our lives. And I think that um, I would want to see a lot more engagement with us because using science and technology does not uh, preclude um, what we've been talking about, engagement with the community. In fact, you can't do good science without talking to the people on the ground. Um, so I think that if we work together, uh, we can make a lot more progress than we have made so far. Um, you bring your solutions, we bring our solutions, and together we will have a better one. Excellent. Excellent. Colleagues, this has been a most enriching, fulfilling discussion. I, when I was asked by the faculty if I would moderate, my, my first thought was, you're not going to go anywhere. But when I saw the range of persons and the caliber, I said, no, man, I would like to be a part of this. And I am very glad I did. Because I'm taking away from this the fact that you all are talking about partnership, about planning, about involving the community. We talk about automation as a way forward and how we can find that partnership to make it work. We talk about the fines and fines that work and fines that need to be. They're not being a deterrent about lack of enforcement, lack of transparency. We should even raise issues like should a bond be raised for social support because that seems to have been lacking. We need to select winners and see how far we can take them in terms of location, species, implementation. But partnerships seem to be at the key of what each of you have said, and I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to share. So I would like to thank each and every one of you for your presentation, for your responding to questions, some of which might have been a little uncomfortable, but we are all here to get the answers that we want. Oh, but most of all, for spending the time to prepare and to be here and share, because now we have, I think, a good foothold to continue this discussion. Linkages that have been made can be taken even further and we can all have a much better environment. What can we do? We can look to each other, look to our communities to let our expertise shine. Thank you very much, colleagues. Do have a good evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.